Hi, I'm Matthew and I'm here with Digby Fairweather. We're both trustees of the Jazz Centre UK and we're currently running a National Lottery Heritage Fund project all about celebrating the 100 Club. And one of the approved purposes um, of this project is to run a Breaking Barriers research project into minority jazz musicians and um, to run some exhibitions about that. And obviously this has taken a huge amount of different angles and we've got lots of different projects running all at the same time um, around this and Digby's here to tell us a little bit more about that. Yep. So I thought I'd ask Digby, um, why the 100 Club? Why did we start? In the 100 Club opened according to various rumours somewhere between late 1941 and 1942 and from then on all the time that jazz was a popular culture it maintained its identity as a jazz club. But with the variation uh, in the cultural arena from the early 1960s in Britain, it gradually concentrated on a whole variety of different musics. Early on it took on reggae, and it was certainly a central punk venue from the early 1970s, or the middle 1970s at least. And then from the 1990s it turned very much more into a grassroots music venue, which occasionally continued to feature jazz, but also featured a lot of other genres including I suppose well we mentioned punk uh, we should talk about reggae we should talk about grunge grime all those different genres so in a sense as well as being probably the longest running jazz venue of its kind in the world or the longest running nightclub venue it's also been a barrier breaker within itself on many levels so I think that's one of the places where we have to start talking. Yeah, definitely. And you have some quite fond memories of the place. Well, I do. I mean, I really hate to mention it to a young man like yourself, but my jazz career actually goes back, well, I would have to say next year it would be 50 years. Um, I played my first gig at the Hunter Club in 1971 in July, when it was still more specifically a jazz venue. And uh, by my dubious mathematics, that makes it a 50-year professional career. Well, so I've seen very many changes, and I should probably explain to people who don't know me at all that I'm a jazz trumpeter, that I fell in love with jazz by the time I was six years old, which was actually in 1952, and began to take part in its activities from the very early 60s. So I've been enormously lucky in seeing a huge number of changes in the jazz culture, um, challenges old and new, arguments old and new, fashions old and new, and I've found them all equally fascinating, and I've found myself extremely privileged to observe them. So that's one of the reasons why I'm very happy that we're here today to talk about the breaking of barriers where they exist, and also the joy of the music where that exists. Yeah, and from a professional career of almost 50 years, as you mentioned, you must have observed some quite a lot of change, um, oh, quite a lot of barriers that may have been broken or are yet to break. Oh, absolutely, yes. And I think one of the most fascinating things, that's a very good question of yours, by the way, is the fact that changing views have occurred in the jazz world, quite definitely. Um, I've observed them, as I said, with great interest. And they cover a lot of areas, I would say particularly perhaps in the last 30 years. Um, we'll be talking about specific barriers as our chat goes on. But I've certainly noticed, for example, in terms of gender and also, I would say, the rather tender area of racial barriers, um, they have all changed a great deal. And I think that in 2020, which is where we are as we're speaking, it's a very good time to look at some of those barriers. I mean, back when I got first inspired by jazz in the 1960s, um, the scene was extremely different to how it is today. To begin with, most of the jazz giants, as we used to call them, were still alive. So you had, to begin with, a youth culture, which was principally, I would say, until 1963, concerned with jazz. Most of the young people of my generation um, who were more than slightly interested in music, tended to embrace jazz as their own youth culture. That came very abruptly to an end in 1963, which we must talk about, mm. because that actually pertains very strongly to the barriers that exist around jazz today. But certainly, um, yes, I could list off areas of um, barriers which have existed. And I think as we talk along, 
we must speak about them specifically. Yeah, what was that significance of 1963? Well, I suppose for a great many people, it would be very different to actually pinpoint a year at which a cultural cataclysm occurred. Mm. And for people alive today, of your age or even younger, who may drop in on this interview, it's very difficult to express how cataclysmic the arrival of the Beatles was. What they did was, in effect, to wash away all the stale air in Tin Pan Alley. <laughs> um, basically, by being an extremely new definition of what became rock music. Um, they were quickly followed by others. But what they did was lay the foundation stones of what would become, in 2020, our overwhelming popular music culture. And within the next 10 years, jazz was very, very quickly sidelined. The whole public view of jazz became far more dismissive um, because of the total fascination of the arrival of people like the Beatles, the Beach Boys, the Stones, and the Eagles, which were the people that I grew up with because I was a baby boomer. So had I not been infatuated by jazz by the time I was 10 years old in 1956, I would probably have been like the rest of the boomers who grew up and embraced music with the Beatles. Mm. And this whole cataclysmic thing, when I say cataclysmic, I don't mean to be negative about it. No. But the fact of the matter is that it was such an enormous revolution which came along that over the next 10 years, jazz's public aspect altered completely. It turned from a popular culture, which young people spoke about, to an art form which was very clumsily and quickly almost reclassified as a classical music art form. So it achieved its Arts Council grants and it achieved a kind of academic viewpoint from a certain generation. And I would also say that along the way it didn't do itself that many favours. It was of course always going to be um, enveloped by this sudden arrival of this phenomenal band called the Beatles, who were, as I said before, the foundation stones for the whole rock culture. But along with the Beatles over the next 10 or 15 years, there began to grow up this enormous music industry. Now, I've got to confess, I've always had a problem with that, Matt. <laughs> I've never seen music as an industry. To me, music is an art form, and an industry is an industry. But right from the time that the Beatles arrived, a music industry began to grow up, which meant that it was much more profitable for businessmen to deal with pop music than it was with jazz, because it was a much more complicated music. It came from a previous generation and a previous genre. And with the growth of commercial radio, of course, which came along in the 70s, um, after Radio Caroline, which actually came along just prior to this huge, expansive, popular music boom, um, gradually the business of what was popular became endemic to the media. And particularly when commercial radio came along and they piggybacked on this huge revolution of the Beatles and the Stones, it became ever more difficult for responsible media bodies like the BBC to carry on an independent course. If you'd look back at the charter of the BBC when it was first put together by Lord Reith, that rather pompous old gentleman, <laughs> it was actually to educate, to inform and to entertain. But once commercial radio came along, um, the BBC had very little opportunity to do anything but to conform very heavily with what commercial radio was doing because it was competition. So therefore, jazz was progressively sidelined. And although I know that this is a very long subject, I would say it's only very recently, with the advent of Radio 6, that jazz has started to come back into what we might call the general cultural arena again. But you could argue that it's always been there. And oh, yes. I think out of that, and maybe it being out of the limelight of popular music, mm. you've created... Oh, um, it has been created a very diverse genre of music with lots yeah. and lots of different takes on what jazz means and mm. what jazz is. 
and um, not just cultural diversity has come into it, but obviously mm. um, yeah. people's uh, musicianship and mm. the diversity of instruments used, etc. Oh um, yeah, absolutely. I mean, to be honest, when the Beatles came along, I was already playing jazz for fun. I didn't start playing jazz for a living until 1977, although most of the 70s I spent working my way up to a professional status. Mm. But I'll be honest with you, when the Beatles came along, I thought jazz might have had it. And I think the only reason that it hasn't had it, and the fact that it's flourishing so beautifully in 2020, and actually, I think, achieving a very significant cultural renaissance, is because it is a self-expressive art form. Mm. And if you have an art form that offers the individual expression of the soul, whether it's painting or writing books or dancing or whatever, then a self-expressive art form cannot die. And I think probably of possibly all the art forms that I know, jazz is the most instantly self-expressive and urgent of all the art forms mm. because it actually relies very largely on the performance of the moment and the engagement of the audience with this enormously exciting business of improvisational recreation. Of course that's not all of it, but that's some of it. And just to um, put the session towards what we're going to talk about um, a little bit later on, yes. um, what is your take on the contemporary jazz scene as it is today? Oh, I think it's marvellous. And that is not a convenient cliché. <laughs> I think one of the things about jazz, it, it has constantly developed. That's one of the wonderful things about the music. Because it is improvisational, people take from it what they want. In my case, I tended to take from it the musical statements of what I would call the classical um, icons of the music, like Louis Armstrong, Lester Young, Coleman Hawkins, Count Basie, Duke Ellington. But the new generation of jazz musicians is entirely different. And what it's done, I think, is to take the elements of jazz that strike it as still relevant and added it to their uh, own new relevant um, genres of hip hop, reggae, all those things that particularly, if you want to call it, the young Afro-Europeans have grown up with. And that, of course, makes it all the more exciting because it means that the music is developing. There is a danger, which I think has happened with pop music, that pop music has almost become like opera. So you have an enormous number of extremely good tribute bands who will give you all the music of the Yellow or the Stones or the Beatles and do it very well as well. But in the same way, you might go and see a performance of The Marriage of Figaro by Mozart and you're basically expecting to hear the same thing. The extraordinary thing about jazz to me has always been that if you, the audience is prepared to engage with the performer, it's very likely that they'll hear something new and extremely immediate. And that, to me, is one of the great things about jazz. Mm -hmm. Very personal experience. Oh, very much so. Yeah. And I, I think from that, um, I think people can relay their culture behind it. And, and as you were saying before, maybe that cultural diversity through jazz has helped break some of the barriers. Oh, but totally. then at the same time, there are some challenges there and um, I think one of the next topics we're going to talk about is gender to do with jazz and I know you mm. did a very very good interview with Tom Smith. Yes I did. Would you like I was... to plug that a little bit because that's on the Jazz Centre website right now. It is indeed and I was very very pleased to talk to Tom Smith who for anybody who hasn't come across him yet is a young uh, saxophone player who has achieved a good deal of public profile by being finalists in the BBC Jazz Musician of the Year um, television programmes. But leaving aside the accolades, he is a simply superb young creative player, a very good writer. And one of the issues that we discussed was the matter of LGBT, because Tom is gay and has got a band, which is a pioneering band, which he calls, I think quite delightfully, the Queer Tet. And I think that that's very interesting. And one of the things that Tom said, which I thought was extremely profound, he said, unless people know what I am, I cannot give myself honestly to the craft. Um, I know a number of jazz musicians in recent years who have come out, and they're always happier because of that. 
And I have two comments about that situation. One actually comes from the man that we call the Shakespeare of jazz, Louis Armstrong. And when Louis was asked to define jazz all those years ago, he came up with a very short pertinent phrase. Armstrong said, you don't pose, never. And one of the points about being free and open about your sexual orientation is a matter of not posing. And I have a tale actually about one musician I know who I met very early on in my own career, actually in 1969. Um, I won't name him, but he was probably, in my opinion, one of the two or three best jazz singers in the UK, if not the best. He was also a very active mover and shaker for um, young British jazz musicians, finding major record contracts with them for people who otherwise, in the post-Beatle era, would not have stood a chance of recording for his company, which in this case actually was EMI, probably the biggest recording company in, the, in England and arguably one of the biggest in the world. He went to Amsterdam in 1986 because throughout his musical career, certainly at its foundation, if he had owned up to the fact that he was gay, he could have been put in jail. That was how it was. Later on, obviously, things improved somewhat. But when he moved to Amsterdam, he told me that it was the first time he'd seen men dance together, or to embrace, or to, in fact, be lovers. And he spent the rest of his life in Amsterdam, apart from two occasions when he came back to England, when I had the great pleasure and privilege of recording with him. But I do know that for much of his life he was forced to behave like a man, to tell men only jokes, to conceal his sexuality. And leaving aside all of the pain that that must have cost him, we also, by the way, lost a great deal of good music. And I think that's a great shame. Yeah. And for me, that particular man, of whom I was extremely fond and who died last year, is perhaps my greatest example of the way in which not being free and open with your sexuality can actually not only just be a dreadful handicap to the musician concerned, but it can also get rid of an awful lot of good music, which in the end is why we're all here. We're all here to leave a legacy. And unless we can open our hearts and tell the truth in our music, then we are not doing what we should be doing. Yes, and earlier you said that um, jazz is obviously a personal and very expressive form of music, and it could be seen that if you was to hide a part of yourself from that, then your music might not come across the way I could imagine. I mean... Oh, absolutely. Absolutely. And I do think, actually, that our last HLF project was to talk about how jazz had influenced popular culture in the 20th century. That was our last um, National Lottery Heritage Project at the um, Jazz Centre UK. And I was rather taken with the difficulty of that, because to me, since 1963, there has been this huge sidelining side -lining of our craft, which has only just started to be corrected, I think, in a very, very big way, by the way. But people from the pop scene, actually, I think, like Bowie and Tom Robinson mm. and people like that, did a great deal, perhaps, to help pioneer the way in which musicians, jazz musicians, can be open about their sexual orientation or predilection. And I think that's a very good thing. So we've spoken a very small amount about um, the gender barriers, um, mm. but obviously we can't fit absolutely everything in one um, small video. <laughs> um, maybe we should uh, take a look into some of the cultural and racial barriers that may present themselves. I know that there are lots of musicians out there that have very strong views on the subject. Are there things that you've observed through your career um, around that topic? And what are you doing within the project to cover this issue? Well, Matt, that, that's, that's a good question. And I think, to be fair, we must acknowledge the fact that in 2020, there are signs that it is becoming, in some small areas of the music, a rather more tender issue than perhaps it once was. Um, I know from my 
a very long career in jazz, that in the old days, it was generally spoken about that jazz was one of the founding breaking, breaker, uh, breakers of racial barriers. Um, and if we care to go back to the 1920s and 1930s, we can go back to a history where the first mixed race recording sessions took place and where in 1938 Benny Goodman, the white clarinetist, could bring onto the stand with his white drummer Gene Cooper two Afro-Americans called Lionel Hampton and Teddy Wilson. And that in those days, leaving aside for the moment the adverse conditions that black people lived under in those days, that was nevertheless quite a resounding breaking of barriers. I think Though, it is not good enough to quote Miles Davis and say, I don't care who it is, whether he's green, black, blue, white, yellow, or whatever, as long as he can play his horn or play his piano. I don't think that's good enough. And <clears throat> looking at the jazz scene in 2020, I see small vestiges of racial separation. Um, I'm going to come out with this and say that I don't think many people would disagree with me that taking a broad look at, say, the National Youth Jazz Orchestra, that that is seen very largely as a white organisation and that Gary Crosby's pioneering Tomorrow's Warriors is probably generally seen as a black organisation. And I'm interested in that um, because I think it's something that time will hopefully put right and that we will one day all see ourselves simply as jazz musicians who come from Britain. What do you think the education system in Britain could do to help um, tackle some of these issues? Um, do you think there is an inherent lack of funding or do you think there oh, yeah. needs to be um, different ways of teaching jazz music? Oh, there's um, leaving aside the London colleges, and we shouldn't, by the way, forget the colleges that exist outside London because they're equally important at Newcastle, Leeds, Birmingham, Conservatoire. They're all extremely important, but I think it would be generally true to say that there is an abysmal lack of funding for every generation of jazz education. Um, we don't yet find ourselves quite sure in our society of 2020 whether jazz is a legitimate form of music um, and also whether, and this is quite important I think, whether it offers an arena of performance. And to my great regret, I would have to say that I'm doubtful that it does. So if you wanted to take a parallel, you might say you could train a doctor to become a medical practitioner and then put him on a desert island with nobody else there. So it becomes a useless situation. I don't say that that's the case with jazz completely, but I do not believe that there is, if you like, a formalized setting for graduates who come from the London colleges or who, in my case, fall in love with jazz and teach themselves to play it. Um, Yes, there are nightclubs. Yes, there are theatre orchestras. But somebody who comes from the Royal Academy with a degree in jazz studies might very well find himself going to the pub to play with a local rhythm section for £50. And that is not over yet. Quite how we deal with it, I don't know. But I think funding comes into it. Definitely. And I do know that, for example, if you're a classical musician, and I'm not saying that they're totally secure in their profession, but when you consider the funding that is offered to symphony orchestras and to opera in the UK, and then also consider the blunt fact that there is no public governmental funding for jazz of any kind, then I think you have a pretty strong case for saying that funding is at the very heart of, of what jazz education needs to acquire. Yes, and um, through this project we've tried to fill a very, very small potential of that hole and we've run some of our own workshops. Indeed, we have, and, yes. Um, 
we in, have... in this in this very difficult period, because as we are speaking, for people who may see us in years to come, in the midst of the COVID nineteen problem, we've managed to acquire an extremely gifted professional jazz tutor called Pete Long to um, provide, and I think this is great actually, uh, an opportunity for musicians who are either on the step ladder on the way to professionalism, or in some cases have actually passed their professional years and are playing for fun. And we've been able to organize a whole set of jam sessions with everybody from school children to old age pensioners to enjoy swapping. And I've been delighted to see that that is a very multicultural exercise which Pete organized. It, it actually, I, I suspect actually quite by accident, but very fortuitously includes most of the matters that we've spoken about today, gender, race, and so on and so forth. Mm. And it has been a very successful, tiny contribution, which to me would be a, a very good example for people to look at and maybe to learn a little from. I think it shows the success that that kind of jam session can bring and also heighten the experience of those musicians. Oh, absolutely. That are trying to establish maybe a circuit or something like that. Yes. Um, I think, you know, one of the things that I've noticed over the years, particularly since the growth of the music industry, is that one of the inherent problems that jazz faces and which creates its own barrier, and I've actually spoken about this in meetings with yourself, Matt, and with our trustees board, one of the problems that jazz has presented for itself is that most of the general population, and I'm not talking about the impassioned people who run the centre or on the National Jazz Archive or the thousands and thousands of musicians who have given their lives to it and have done so since probably a hundred years. The fact of the matter is that for most people they do not know the tune and they do not know the words. And I think that's one of the great problems for the people who during my fairly long career in jazz have tended to put up their hands and say I don't like jazz because they don't know the tune and they don't know the words. And for many people, that's what they want from music. And I can quite understand that, actually. By having a jazz performance, you're asking people to enter with yourself or with your fellow musicians on something like a musical adventure. And that is a challenge in itself, which we have to overcome. Mm. It's, it's a barrier. and. I would say that at the Jazz Centre UK, which of course we're both deeply involved with, um, I think our policy has tried to be to remind people that jazz is not this awful, inaccessible, peculiar, um, individual art form, but actually it's extremely accessible. Mm. And I do believe that one of the great advantages that we have had, which is fortunate for us, is that over the last 30 years, I would say, probably since the foundation of Classic FM, we have had people getting used to liking more than one sort of music. I mean, 40 years ago, very few young people, in my view, listened to classical music. Um, we also have a great many sources for people to listen to all kinds of different music. Um, folk music, jazz music, uh, classical music, of course, with the phenomenal success of Classic FM. There are a lot more musical sources for people to explore. We also have YouTube, which you and I both use. And we have lots of other ways of getting to music. And the nice thing that's happened to me as a professional musician is, whereas 40 years ago, if I went to somebody in the street and said, do you like jazz? They'd probably either say, what's that? Or no, I don't like jazz. But now most people say to me, yes, I like jazz. I like a lot of different sorts of music, but that includes jazz. And to me, that's a very big step across that barrier because it means that people are now open-eared again in the way that they most certainly were not in the 60s when the Beatles came along. In those days, you either liked the Beatles or the Stones. But that's a long, long time ago. It's 60 years nearly 
And 60 years is a long time for public views to be adjusted. Mm. And I do believe that that's one of our strongest um, buttresses of support, if you like. And um, just to conclude, I suppose, uh, we've talked about um, students today and also people starting off their careers. Mm. Do you have any advice for the students and early beginners that are just growing into uh, music in 2020 um, starting off their careers in jazz music? I know it's a very difficult time at the moment being that we're in the middle oh, of yes. the pandemic. I'm very sorry for people in 2020 <laughs> because they can't get together and explore each other's musical ideas as easily. If I had advice, I think I would say, follow your heart. You, one of the biggest decisions I ever made was to go down a route of jazz which was not fashionable, which was classic and traditional jazz. Um, that was rather resented as being an outcrop of the now long forgotten trad boom, which from 1960 to 63 sent jazz musicians to the top of the hit parade. People like Kenny Ball, Ackerbill, Chris Barber, and dozens of others were the stars of their day. Um, they were blown out of the room comprehensively by the Beatles within a year <laughs> in 63. Um, <clears throat> but I would say follow your heart. And one other thing I would say is don't be afraid to explore all the areas of jazz. And the reason I say that is because for the first 40 years of its life, let's say from 1900 to 1940, Jazz produced some of its greatest performers, but it was basically an oral tradition where the great point about any jazz performer was that they would, on their instrument, find their own voice. So you had musicians like Benny Goodman, Jack Teagarden, Louis Armstrong, as we said, the Shakespeare of jazz, mm. Big Spiderbeck, and those kinds of people. And it was only really with the advent of modern jazz from the 1940s that the way you played jazz became quantifiable and written down. So I've found uh, in my otherwise unqualified admiration for the business of jazz education that quite a lot of musicians who do go through the courses say, yes, I've enjoyed that. I know all about alternate scales. I know all about tritone substitutes. I know all about the things that are teachable. But I don't know very much about the oral tradition of the early years. Mm. or indeed the oral tradition of the later years which espouse the classifications of the earlier years. And that is very largely an oral tradition. Therefore, it's very difficult to write down. And I would encourage any musician to explore, to um, have a look at YouTube once in a while, not just on the people that you've heard about in your college, but also the people that you might find in the classical books about jazz. Um, people like Jack Teagarden or Louis mm. Armstrong because they made a huge contribution. But it's very hard to quantify it in technical terms. So I would say explore. And then when you've explored, follow your heart. Because unless, as we talked earlier, when we were talking about the other subject, unless you honestly find the music that you want to play and pursue that, then you're not following your heart. In the same way, I remember Robert De Niro, the actor, talking about finding his personality and what mm. he wanted to do. And he said, that's the first thing you must do. And I see a certain correlation between acting and being a jazz musician. Although I would be absolutely loath to say that being a jazz musician involves acting. On the contrary, it involves absolute creative honesty. Just like Louis Armstrong said, you don't pose, never. <laughs>